What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Happens, and with the Workshops Work podcast, it's my mission to help you to make your workshops work. Today with me on the show is Tamara Aberle. And we cut the episode in two parts, where in part one, we explore the topic of serious games and its difference to gamification. On part two, we're going to dive deep into alternatives to sticky notes. And we enjoy a quite controversial conversation about the pros and cons of sticky notes and how we can harvest ideas in alternative ways. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand, you can simply visit workshops.work, search for episode 40 and download my notes. So enjoy the show. Hello, Tamara. Hi. I am super excited to talking to you today after having seen your blog posts on how to get rid of post-it notes, how to avoid the tyranny of sticky notes. I just loved it. And I couldn't resist but reaching out to you to learn more. And through our pre-conversations and even now before we turned on the mic, We came up with a million other topics that we could explore. <laughs> And I always thought I was a random idea generator um, until I met you. You are a certified professional facilitator. Mm -hmm. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? What's your story? Yeah, well, I entered the world of facilitation in the early 2000s and I came at it through conflict resolution and mediation. Mm -hmm. I was really, really interested in that field. I was actually in the stages of moving towards being a trained mediator and working around conflict and dispute resolution. And someone had said to me, hey, why don't you check out this course on facilitation? It also is a practice that can help with conflict resolution, especially preventatively, but also in the moment and you might like it. So I did that and I never looked back. I totally felt at home in the role and I absolutely love the challenges that come with group dynamics. And I also really like the potential impact that well-designed group processes have. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I fell into it. It's interesting that you're mentioning the conflict resolution. When I think conflict and I think games and this playful way how you design your workshops, on the one hand, I think it's a total opposite. On the other hand, I believe that it's the perfect combination. So what yeah. is it about games that attracted a conflict resolution specialist or mediator? Well, I mean, that was back in the day when that was my kind of specialty or my focus. And then of course, over the years, I've honed my skills as a facilitator. And today I'm primarily focused around the areas of strategy, innovation, and creative problem solving. But the reality is that in everyone's facilitation practice, we are always being prepared or designing for some potential difference mm. of A viewpoint, a perspective of opinion, a uh, difference of roles, where there could be some kind of conflict or contradiction in what's happening. And of course, that's often why we're brought into the space in the first place. So whether we are doing creative problem solving, developing a vision, or whether we're doing public participation and engagement, you know, all of us as facilitators inevitably are addressing un potential or existing underlying conflicts. Mm. When we stumbled into the world of games and serious business game design, one of the things that certainly is quite appealing and is you know, a unique quality that well-designed business games bring is that they create a safe space mm -hmm. for people to experiment, for people to have rich dialogue, to work through complex or wicked problems, and to bring their individual perspectives to the mm -hmm. table. So the world that you create when you create the game play, when you step into that world, you suspend reality for a short period of time. I mean, it's part of the kind of 
social agreement that we have around games, right? We're now going to step into this castle or this world of dinosaurs or this cycle of change with boats floating around it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be in that space for a little while. And it's a safe place for all of us to bring our ideas and our, and our thoughts together. So I think that's one of the things that I really, not just theoretically, because it is sort of can be demonstrated through research and through theory mm -hmm. that games do this, but also just through practice and watching it happen. Yeah. We've absolutely seen that all the different games that we've played with our clients, it levels the power playing field, right? Where there's different roles. Well, this is a game about creativity. And so the marketing person is going to be the best at this. Well, that's not necessarily <laughs> how it happens, right? Yeah. When you step into mm -hmm. the game play, everything shifts and changes. And it, mm -hmm. it really allows more, like all voices to come forward because after all, it's safe. You're just playing a game. So, yeah. When is this one moment? that in which your participants realize that they just entered a safe space. Because I can imagine that at first, when you tell serious business people that they're going to play a serious game mm -hmm. in order to explore their creativity, that at first they will be pushed out of their comfort zone because they might expect a workshop with sticky notes, with sitting around a mm -hmm. table, maybe with scribbling but they don't expect to play dragon games. Yeah. So when do they realize that it's actually safe to be there. Yeah. Well, I think just to step back before that moment for a second, when you're designing any session, of course, we have to be very attentive to who is in the room, whatever process you're choosing to use, will that process, will they allow themselves into that process? Mm -hmm. Or are you actually going to get so much resistance that there's no point, right? Like you might think it's a great process and it works mm -hmm. with other groups, but you have to be attentive to, you know, ensuring there's a balance between pushing people out of their comfort zone and actually getting so much resistance that you're not being productive. Mm -hmm. uh, so games are not for every group and we only use them when it's appropriate, when the client sees that, that it will have results and it will be effective. I would just be curious Who is it for and what kind of problems can you then solve with a game? But I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Well, I think there's, I've seen well-designed uh, serious games, organizational games on almost every topic. Mm -hmm. So it, it could be a game on culture, developing culture. It could be a game on innovation and creative problem solving. You could have one on conflict resolution. You can have one on strategy. There's, a, there's one uh, I just got a tour of in Sweden, which is all about kind of managing the IT process. So, you know, if you can, if you've got the topic, you can, you know, create a game around it. Mm. Who is it for? Well, just like any process design that we do, uh, we're thinking about the who and mm -hmm. who might this be useful for. And different games might have different um, intentions or different audiences that it's designed for. We have a game, which is an innovation game and uh, called Innovator Dinosaur. And that game is basically for any group that wants to shake up their thinking and generate new and different ideas. Now, there's other ways of doing that other than the game. And sometimes the game is not the appropriate tool. And so we don't bring it out. We use other methods to do exactly that same purpose. So you, you just work with the client to get a feel for, you know, is this something they're open to and then they want to experiment with? What would be your testing the water question to find out whether it's a game client or non-game client? Yeah, I think you just go straight to it, right? Just be direct and say, okay, we've got different options. Um, I always <clears throat> try and give my, my clients options, especially if they're, they're new clients and we're just getting to know each other and kind of building that trusting relationship is just to say, okay, here's a variety of things that we can do. Having it right there physically in front of you so they can actually see it and see the benefits of it mm -hmm. makes a really 
big difference for sure. And they'll tell you right away, you know, this will work or this won't work. And I have some clients who are like, oh my God, this is so exciting. I totally want to play this game. Mm -hmm. And others who say, you know what, we're not in the mood. Uh, This is not kind of where we want to go. The more trusting my relationship is with them, the more open they are. Mm -hmm. But I've seen, for example, you know, people think, oh, well, that's all games are fine for frontline staff and employees and maybe some community groups, but the C-suite would never want to play a game. I mean, the VPs and the directors and that, (laughs) they're not, you know, that's not appropriate. That is, I call total BS on that because I've been, you know, on the 50th floor of Bay Street, towers in downtown Toronto where there's all these like high powered lawyers and we've had games out uh, on the table and you know I walk into the room and there's all these suits and they're playing with the dinosaurs and you know yeah because it just it releases some inhibitions for people and they're like well it's just a game so it's all about like who's it for it's for a group that's open to it But that's like any process, right? If you're a facilitator and you use a lot of improv or you use a lot of visual stuff or you use a lot of movement in the room, if the group's not open to it, you're not going to get the kind of participation. And it reminds me of having permission to speak about something different than your own problem. So you can kind of put your focus on the game and then speak to the game instead of pointing at the explicit problem that you're working on. And this might make it easier to actually address it and to solve it. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that's part of the suspending reality. So when you're stepping into the gameplay, it can allow you to step outside of the direct issues that you might be experiencing in your work. And it also helps you to get kind of some fresh perspective because you're not bogged down in the minutia of your particular work situation. Mm. You're really, really able to learn through that process. But I want to point out something about the types of games that are Mm. kind of available because I think this is a really important distinction and it gives you some choice. So there are essentially, if you were to categorize them into a couple of types, there's learning games and there's doing games. Mm -hmm. And then there's games, there's a lot of them, which kind of have some sort of combination Mm -hmm. of those things, right? So you will see that the market is dominated by um, learning games. Now, this is especially common in kind of the l and sector, human mm. resources, where they're using a lot of digital learning, quote unquote, games. Everything is um, gamified. Yeah, everything is gamified. And mm. for me, there's actually a distinction between gamification of a process and a serious organizational or business game. So mm. that's kind of a, that's a little bit of another question, but there's a lot of learning games. And of course there are also, you know, the virtual or digital versions of things. And then there's the board games. And our interest is in the tangible concrete. I can touch this. We can move around the board or move around the space. Uh, that's sort of the type of game that we focus on is games that bring people together through real physical space and time and not just the, the virtual digital. There's lots of people who are experts in the virtual and digital and they do a beautiful job of this. So mm-hmm. okay, back to there's learning games. So learning games is where you usually have a scenario, you have different roles and all of these have been created or constructed for you. So you're now going to be Jane or Mads or you're playing with a theme or a metaphor Mm -hmm. or a scenario that's been given to you. So it's understandable to you because it's Mm -hmm. about change or it's about strategy, but it's not your actual thing. So So it's more like a role play. It can be, yeah. I mean, you might be, role play is like a mechanic within a game. So there could be role play within it, but it's basically scenario, Mm -hmm. right? They've created a world for you. Then going back to my spectrum, there's also doing games. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you were saying, well, 
with some games, you are not dealing with your own real stuff. And that allows a really safe place to work through and talk about, for example, conflict in the workplace or a change or transformation process. Absolutely. I have a client I was just talking to yesterday, and we were talking about exploring the cycle of change with her team that's just going through and starting a significant organizational shift. And we were saying, do we need to play this as a scenario or do we need to go through this with their real situation? Mm -hmm. And she said, they're not feeling safe enough. They're feeling very vulnerable. Let's go through it as a scenario. So then we play it as that. The doing games, there are fewer. Mm -hmm. There are fewer doing games. And this is where it can be really helpful when people are thinking about, how do I get rid of sticky notes? (laughs) to go back to our (laughs) tyranny of sticky notes. Sticky notes are often used in processes where you're going to produce something, right? Sticky notes. (laughs) You're going to produce them. (laughs) Yeah, you're going to produce garbage (laughs) recycling. (laughs) But where you're going to actually, something spits at the other end. Like we now have a list of program elements or we now have new ideas or we've mapped a process. Mm -hmm. And so something's coming out the other side. So doing games are, this is where they come in and mm-hmm. where they ha- can actually help you replace processes where you might otherwise have used sticky notes. Okay, so I had mentioned, I'll just speak to this one example because our Innovator Dinosaur game is a doing game. Now, it's all about creative and critical thinking. It helps you generate new and different ideas and move those to action. You will learn through the gameplay creative and critical thinking techniques. Mm -hmm. That's a secondary kind of benefit. But the primary benefit is that you're actually using real work opportunities and challenges and the output of the game is real ideas, projects, and initiatives that you can then implement in your workplace and an actual action plan. So it's a workshop with a kind of, you know, robust underlying methodology, Mm -hmm. but it's framed with a game. So there are, these are a little, sometimes a little harder to design, Mm -hmm. which is why a lot of people focus on the learning games Mm -hmm. and why there's so many, but the doing games are the ones that really help us turn the page on uh, the sticky note. I'm Rain. I'm from Experiential Learning. We facilitate programs for executives and we use Session Lab because it's a very easy tool to design a meeting easy to share with your colleagues and get a script for the meeting in no time without too much hassle. So visit sessionlab.com and find out more yourself. So I have two questions related to that. One is, can these doing games stand by themselves or do they always need you or another facilitator to guide the group through them? And How do you actually then capture the results if you don't have sticky notes? Oh my God. (laughs) Ah, no sticky notes, no sticky notes. (laughs) Panic. (laughs) Maybe just a sheet of paper. (laughs) So, okay. Do you always need a facilitator? Let me start with that. It totally depends on how the game is designed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've designed games where... Of course, it's very helpful to have a facilitator. I mean, our practice is a practice of facilitation, of group workshops. So naturally for us, that's where we gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. However, there are lots of games. There's a a great company in the UK called um, Focus Games, and they specialize in games, learning games for the healthcare sector. Mm. And uh, they might use a bit of a train-the-trainer model. It might be about, you know a game to support nurses in learning how to be really effective in the ward or something like that. Or it might be around how to promote hand washing in uh, hospitals. Mm -hmm. So they have different games that are good for that. But a lot of their games can just be played 
So you could just grab the box, open it up, and whoever's around the table mm-hmm. comes in. It doesn't need to be facilitated. So lots and lots of examples where it's facilitation is not required. The group is self-empowered. But it's also the case that I think there is an important role for facilitation in some of the, the games because the games are just a tool, just mm-hmm. like any of our tools as facilitators. And you can choose to use that tool instead of another process, but it is just your process in a game Mm -hmm. format, right? So it can still require facilitation. We have tried to, with some of our games, we've designed, we've designed games for clients. So they then go off and facilitate them or lead them, use them with their teams. Some of our games, once we've trained people on them, We have clients who own multiple copies and they use them in lots of different ways. So they might just sit down with one team and play. So once they know how to play, it's Mm -hmm. fine. There's a wonderful new game out of, it's a Norway, Austria co-production called Lord McGroundworks Castle of Teams. (laughs) I love this game. We've used it with our clients. I love it. It's so good. And it's all about kind of developing high performing teams and learning the key elements required for those teams. This game, while the group really self-directs the play during the workshop. It requires facilitation for the reflection, especially Mm -hmm. because you're going to go really deep and you need, that's really where our role shines as facilitators Mm -hmm. is in that deeper dialogue and reflective piece to help the group get the most out of it. So, you know, range of possibilities. I was just thinking that When you spoke about our role as facilitators, it's also about holding the safe space because obviously the game allows to have the safe space to dive into this new world. But you still, I think, depending on how deep you want the group to go, you still need someone to hold that space and to make sure that everyone kind of respects the rules is maybe too much that you have the right dynamic in the group, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we still have, whether you're using a game tool for a process or whether you're doing improv or whether you're doing a sticky note workshop or whether you're doing an agile process, whatever process you're doing, I mean, we have the same role to play. Mm -hmm. But it it has been very interesting to me. I did have to do a shift in my facilitation, I had to consciously let go of a certain level of intervention, if you will. Mm. When people start playing, they want to be left alone. Mm. They don't want to be interrupted. They don't want you to go, so when you made that move, what were you thinking? And how does that (laughs) affect your... They're like, back (laughs) off. I have got to get around this board or I need to achieve this many resources and I still haven't got my little uh, gold cube that I've been (laughs) searching for. You know, they're really immersed and there's a flow because the game is a structure. It's not just gamification of an element of your process. It is a process from beginning to end. It has a start, it has a finish, it has a way to win, Mm -hmm. and it has challenges throughout. And people want to move through that. And so I do find that short of making sure the group's not going down a rabbit hole Mm -hmm. or answering questions around instructions, my facilitation has to, I have to step back a bit. And I've, I've, it's been an interesting kind of practice to, to watch that happen. The group is way, way more empowered to drive the process themselves. And I love this paradox of professional facilitation going hand in hand with letting go. So the less you do, I have the impression as a facilitator, the more you show professionalism because your role shifts into just holding the space and giving responsibility back to the group. And I have the impression that they will only take the space when they feel that they can trust you and trust the process. Yeah. So it seems as if the professional facilitator doesn't do much. (laughs) Actually, (laughs) 
uh oh, Shh, don't say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's funny that you say that because I'm going to circle us back to the sticky note thing and my campaign <laughs> to challenge us as a community of facilitators, to challenge us as a community of facilitators to rethink and try and experiment with new and different tools. Because you mentioned, well, wait a minute, as facilitators, you know, what are we doing? Like in a game, for example, we're backing off a little bit, but, and you know, what role are we really playing? But I started this journey of wanting to push and challenge myself to innovate the tools that we use. Because I walked into a room one day, we hadn't even started the session. And one of my clients was already writing her ideas on the sticky note. Awesome. Well, then what the hell am I doing there? Mm -hmm. I have done nothing to provoke or stimulate, challenge her thinking, inspire her, or, you know, even to, to get her to work collaboratively. Because in her mind, I've worked with her for so long, she's already decided well, this is the process. I have an idea in my head. Idea goes on the sticky note, sticky note goes on the wall. We match it up with other people and we're done. After we vote. We yeah. Second. And... I just thought, oh, hold on a minute. I'm not being helpful. And that's when I thought I need to look for new ways to change two things. So kind of two of my goals around the challenging ourselves around tools are I want to change the experience, right? People talk about sticky note fatigue and brainstorming, creative problem solving, collaboration, the dominant image we see on the internet is like walls of sticky notes with people staring mm. at them. I'm like, how do we change that dominant image so that when people walk into the room, they, they say, well, wait a minute, this is different. And that moment is really important, right? That moment helps them to shift, immediately begin to shift their set mind and their set mind has been set by the kind of the also can be set by the tools that we provide. The other thing I want to change and affect, which I think is our job as facilitators is to have an effect on the cognitive process. Mm -hmm. We're not just moving pieces around a board. We're not just shuffling paper. We're not just timekeepers and, you know, who's next and who wants to say something now and here's your process, write this down, put it up. We're not just kind of guiding people through a process. We're actually there to stimulate and affect their thinking. So I'll give you an example of which I, I'm quite inspired by. This is, there's a creative agency in Montreal, Canada. It's called Sidley, and they actually are part owners in Cirque du Soleil, which is, you know, one of this mm -hmm. incredibly creative and exciting human circus. And they have a meeting room in their space that has a crooked low door to enter. Mm -hmm. So when you go into the meeting room, you must physically alter your body shape and stance in order to enter. You have to duck your head. You have to shift your shoulder in order to get into the space. And once you're in the space, the tables are wonky. The chairs are really oddly shaped. They're, some of them are actually uncomfortable or you fall off them when you sit on them. And all of this is, it's not the end all be all, but it's part of their attempt to trigger or stimulate the thought that, wait a minute, this is different. And that's where I think we can, if we innovate around the tools, then we have a chance. It's part of this. It's not everything in the equation, but I, I do believe it's part of it. Totally. I totally agree. And I think that through the games, it's not only that you disrupt the presumption that we do need sticky notes, and I love the example of this woman already starting to try to brainstorm by herself, but also by surprising the participants, this is the moment where we learn, right? If we're surprised, we have emotions, and then we will remember this workshop. Because if, if all the workshops end up to be the same, us using sticky notes, same structures, same processes, 
same discussion, same arguments, then yeah. one workshop will just be like the other. And then how to stand out and how, how do, can we actually expect the results to last and the experience to last? Yeah. Well, it's, an, it's a really, um, I think, interesting point there because A, we want real results. Mm -hmm. So my clients don't just want great dialogue mm -hmm. and didn't we have a nice day? We, we all talked and it was so deep and you know, they, they're not, that's great, but they want actual concrete results. They want a mm -hmm. strategy at the end. They want innovative ideas at the end. They want a change process. They want a new program framework and they want it documented and they want it to be real. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.